Ladies and gentlemen, good evening boxing and MMA fans from around the world. Introducing from Bassett, California, the third man in the ring, Popeye Ray. Welcome to Third Man in the Ring. I'm your host, Popeye Ray. Today we got another awesome interview. We've been trying to get all the commentators to come on the show. Now I got the best. Sergio Mora from DAZN. You know, you guys know his face. Did you know he was the WBC lightweight middleweight champion? Twice challenger for the WBA middleweight title. His first winning was the contender. Remember the contender with Rocky uh, Sylvester Sloan? Homeboy won a million dollars, so I'm going to ask him to spot me at least a hundred. But today, <laughs> today, I want you to give him a warm welcome to Sergio Mora. Oh man, it's a pleasure, Ray. Thank you. So it much. really is a Thank pleasure, honestly. On, uh, that, that's one of the best intros I've got. That's real, that's right. man. That's, that's real. right. I felt that one. There you go. <laughs> so, hey, Sergio, real quick, tell the fans, um, how was your amateur career? We'll start there. How was your amateur career? Well, you're looking at it, Ray. When I came in here, I just, uh, I, I came back in time, right? This, this very ring. South Omani Boxing this Gym. This very Bandera. gym is, uh, even though I trained in East LA and Montebello, that's where my gyms were. This is where I made my bones. You know, I got all yeah. the best work in this very ring against Perro Angulo, Marco Antonio Rubio, Nick Martinez, uh, Jose Soto Carras. I mean, we got some big names, I guys. Mean, we, this, I mean, we would just, they, they would film Max Boxing here, Doug Fisher and uh, Steve Kim. They would film yeah. Gym Wars here. And we were pretty much on every other episode because we really... We'll go to war. Was this prior to contender or oh, after? Prior. No, 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 everything was prior to contender. Oh, you know, okay. I was uh, 16, 17, 18 years old when I was going to war here with some of Ben Lira's best, man. And, uh, and it, it, was, it, it really is what made me a fighter, this, this ring right here. I mean, I, I learned how to box in Montebello, East L.A., but I learned how to fight here in, in this ring. What gym was in East L.A.? I started off in Eddie Heredia, off oh, of Olympic. Leg legendary gym and there. And then uh, from there, uh, I went to Montebello Pell with uh, Dean Campos and John Montelongo. Okay. Montelongo was a police officer there. And they showed me more attention there, and that's where I stayed. Oh, awesome, awesome. So what, what was your amateur career? You know, I didn't really have that, that great of an amateur career as far as, like, my, my wins and losses. I think I had about 55 fights. I probably lost about 15. But I did make it to the Olympic trials with only, you know, 50, 60 amateur fights. So I made it to the Olympic trials in 2000. I won my first two fights and then I lost in the finale to actually make the team to oh, Jermaine okay. Taylor. Jermaine Taylor ended up winning a bronze medal in Sydney, Australia. And I remember thinking, man, I almost Good beat fun. that guy. I almost got him. I almost mate. got him. I almost made the team. And that's what yeah. made me, you know, uh, continue this journey saying, well, if he can win a bronze medal and I almost beat him, let me try this pro thing, you know, maybe yeah, it'll work yeah. out for me. So let's, let's jump ahead. We're going to jump back and forth, but let's jump ahead. Where did the contender come into? Well, I was training for a fight in, on NBC. Uh, it was going to be my first televised fight. I was going to fight at a guy named Les Ralston, undefeated guy, 13-0. and 0. I was 11-0. and 0. And uh, I remember I was sparring in San Diego, uh, getting some good work down there. And, and one of the sparring partners brought it up. Hey, have you heard about the show The Contender? Yeah. Long story short, that's where I first heard about it, but then it came true when I was sparring with Fernando Vargas and Big Bear. You know, oh, I would okay. go up to Big Bear and spar Fernando Vargas as, and his manager at the time, Rolando Arellano, was taking a bunch of his fighters to the tryouts. To like an audition, audition type thing? Audition, yeah. So they said, Sergio, would you, would you want to join us, be a part of it? I go, I don't want to wait in that big ass line. Wow. I thought it was going to be like American Idol yeah. when it was going to be a long line. I'm like, I'm not going to wait in that line. He's like, no, 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 no. We're gonna we're gonna get special treatment because of Vargas. We're gonna go straight to the front of the line because the Sylvester oh, Stallone likes Vargas. Yeah, yeah. Long story short, that's that's how it happened. You know, I, I tried out that yeah. way. They liked me I, right I worked away. that that first show too. I worked that first show. I refereed uh, a couple of fights there. But yeah, I remember you. And honestly, bro, I'm not gonna blow smoke. It just didn't cross my mind that you would actually win it until I start seeing you fight. <laughs> when I start seeing you fight, I go, wow, this guy's a lot got of people, skills. A lot of people, Ray, it's not just you. I was a 16 to 1 underdog, you know, to win that. When the odds came out on yeah. that show, I was 16 to 1. I mean, there was guys that were legitimate contenders on that show. Like yes. Ishay Smith, he yes. was 15 and 0. He was ranked. Uh, Peter Manfredo was 19 and 0. Yeah, he, had he was ranked. Already. Jesse Brinkley, uh, he was 25 and 0. He was ranked. And surprisingly, those are the three guys that I had to beat to win the show. 
Props crazy, to you, man. Crazy, you. man. That's right. I had to beat the three legitimate contenders yeah, to become the contender. Yeah. yeah, that was a that was an awesome show, bro. So let's go to your pro pro fights, man. So what was the big deal about what was the problem about the Taylor fight the first time? Jermaine Taylor fight. Yes. Uh, yeah, man. I'm glad you brought that up, Brett. Because again. I'm glad you brought that up. Huh. I thought we we're gonna keep the, the punches high. <laughs> a little high. Like, right there, the first question, you're going low on me, man. Well, the reason why I say is because now that I know you, now that you won the contender, now I'm looking out for your career. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now I'm saying, like, well, I know that guy. Eh? I'll tell you what happened, man. I'll be real with you. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Even though I fought Jermaine Taylor in the uh, amateurs, uh, I only had one 10 round fight under my belt. Uh, and all the other ones were eight-rounders, six-rounders. And so, Jermaine Taylor already was a 12-round yeah. fighter. He fought Bernard Hopkins twice. He was he an was undefeated champion. He, he was, was HBO's role. darling. He was undefeated. Here's this contender winner with only one 10-round fight under my belt and 16 fights. So if you want to dig into that, what's that about? Well, we're going to jump into that later, but what's that about that they would pick you to fight him? Are they, you know what, let's try to get another no. win? Or? Same reason Vern uh, Vernon Forrest. Uh, decided to fight me. It wasn't that I was highly ranked. I was ranked in the top 10, but I was, you know, nowhere near but the... But you had a name, though. I had the name. And that's what it I had is. the name, and I was, coming off, I was coming off a, a reality show where 12 million people watched me, yeah. and, uh, you know, I was red hot as far as uh, celebrity-wise. Maybe not, yeah. you know, boxing-wise as far as, the, the you know, the number one ranking, but, you know, this is a game of politics as well and promoting. Yeah. So they said... Uh, let's get know, a let, name. Let's get there. this... Let's get, They'd rather fight me than Kasim Uma, which he fought. They'd rather fight me instead of Corey Spinks, who was a champion at the time. They were offering me these opportunities because of my uh, recognition. People knew me. I was hot as a celebrity, not as yes, a boxer. Yes. So they decided to throw me a bone. And I said no to the Jermaine Taylor one. Was it hard, Sergio? Uh, you know, he, had, he was undisputed at the time. He had all four belts. I had history with him. Um, they offered me really, really good money. But I just wasn't ready. You know, I, I, I remember looking at my trainer. My trainer, Dean, was like, look, man, you're, you're not going to get blown out of the water. You're not going to get knocked out. You're going to probably end up losing a decision because every close round, they're going to give it to him. So do you want to take this fight, lose a decision and, and have your first loss for money? Or do you want to just go yeah. straight, you know, look for the right opportunity to win a championship undefeated? Yeah, yeah. And I chose the latter. And it was a smart move. It I was a smart move because uh, worst scenario, you would have lost that fight and they would have just pushed would, you aside. I probably wouldn't. You would have had to fight more harder to, to get up there. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you made that decision and it got publicity because you made that decision. Hey, it was negative so, publicity, but I don't mind it. because do you think so? Odd. Is it, isn't uh, publicity, good publicity is good as good as any bad. publicity is good publicity. Yeah. They say, yeah, I guess so. But you know, when you're about it on ESPN, they talked about uh, Brian Kenny talked yeah. about it. Uh, Joe Testor talked about all the big, all the big networks talked about it. Dan Raphael is probably the one that that really laid into me the worst, you know, on ESPN. So and gotta be one, always. and there always gotta be that guy. So that you know, I, that one really uh stuck, stuck to me. And I, I let him know in person, face to face, That's right? <laughs> how I felt about that, but uh, no, nah, I, I wasn't to be ready. on that side of. You know how we handle business, man. We that's don't, right. we don't, we don't go on Twitter. I'm gonna tell you straight to your face. face huh? that's, uh, that's right. That's <laughs> right. So we move on, and you, you've been in some great action-packed fights, bro. And I mean, well, on another note, me as a referee, I had one of my most embarrassing moments <laughs> in Sergio's fight. Uh, January, it was in Cas Morongo Casino. It was live on. Was it ESPN? It was uh, either ESPN or it was a Spanish network fight. I forget. Either, either. either way, bro. It was, it was televised and it was main event. That's right. And uh, everybody swore up and down that Sergio hit me, but <laughs> I tripped. I tripped. I landed on my butt. I handled it well. Hey, that's bro. what I said about when Dan Daniel Jacobs knocked me down. Get on, you tripped. And okay. I tripped, man. I tripped. Child, I, man, I you got to believe it. I walked out with a fat lip, but I tripped, all right? But... Uh, that was that was a good fight. I mean, uh, reading the the reading about the fight today, they said it was a controversial stop, but you were laying it on him, bro. Man, nah, you what know what? It, want? It, it, this, what did the fans his, want? His, his name was Rito Ruvacalva. Ru Rito. He uh, he had thirty one wins, twenty nine by knockout. So this dude could punch, right? Yeah. 
And I remember thinking he was just glancing me with blows, and I could feel how how hard he punched. So I'm glad I stopped him because That's I didn't right. want to go. I didn't want to go any more with him. That dude punched hard. You were putting hands on him, bro. And I told him answer back. And again, I tripped and uh, <laughs> landed right on my butt, but I, I handled it well, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm glad you stopped that fight, by the way. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so let's go to the Vernon Forest fight. Yeah. It was right after that fight. Right after that Rita, Rita Ruba Calva fight, I get the call to fight uh, Vernon Forrest. And, um, May he I, rest in peace, but, but yeah, man. I, that I, was a big fight. Right? I accepted that fight immediately. And believe it or not, my trainer, Dean Campos, uh, he, he didn't agree with that fight because you know, Vernon Forrest was one of his favorite fighters. I remember when I was an amateur, he would tell me, uh, that's one style you never want to fight. That guy does everything that will beat you. He fights at range. So you he agree with the jab. styles make fights? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember him clearly telling me that's one style that will beat you. I'd rather you fight Felix Trinidad than Vernon Forrest. I'd rather you fight Oscar Dole. I know what you're thinking. Yeah. But anyway, that's what my trainer would tell me back then. Vernon Forrest has a perfect style to beat a style like yours. You know. So I remember uh, the only reason I accepted that fight is because I sparred Vernon Forrest one time at Wild Card Gym mm -hmm. right after the contender. And I laid hands on him, man, right in front of everybody at wild card. And I remember he got pissed off at me. He was calling me names. I aggravated him, but yeah, I laid yeah. hands on him. Yeah. And I'm thinking, he wasn't, that, he, wasn't, he wasn't that bad. He wasn't that bad. So then when they offered me that fight, I accepted it immediately. And my trainer was kind of worried about it. Turned out right, though. Yeah, it turned out right. Turned out guys. right, guys. Yeah. Turned out right. And then uh, what about the Mosley fight? Ah, man, you know, the Mosley fight, there's a lot of... Honestly, real quick, I got love for both of you. I kind of grew up in the Ballin Park, El Monte, mostly here, but we'd go to Ballin Park, so I used to see Shane. He was a little kid, eh? Mm. But then as you guys went to fight, I go, man, that's a hard one, eh? That's a hard one, but I still watch it. Eh? Who do you think won? Be honest. Be honest, Ray. Come on now. Y you won by... If you like brawling, if you like the tough guy, you won. If you got the, the points, Mosey won. That's the best way I could put it, bro. It was but a I'm draw. not a judge. I'm not it a was judge. A draw, so. I know, but I'm not a judge. No, nah, no, nah, I hear you, man. I don't judge, I guess. Well, I'll know? tell you what happened in that fight. Um, believe it or not, I lost it. I lost that fight mentally be the night before. Prior. The night before. We weighed in, and it was one of those scales on the floor. I hate those scales. I, don't, I like the, the, the regular scales. I don't like the... The, the, the Toledo Yeah, the those... Toledo those for some reason, you move them, they're inaccurate. But long story short, I was overweight. All the B side of that opponent of that card was overweight. So I wasn't the only one overweight. There was three other fighters that were the B side that were overweight. You're telling me I was three and a half pounds overweight in one of my biggest fights of my career? That's one. Two, you're telling me that I lost three and a half pounds in 20 minutes that I was gone? I was only gone 25 minutes. I timed it. I literally went and ran like two miles on a treadmill, came back, and I made the weight. I've never lost three and a half pounds in my life that quick. That's how I know that skill was wrong. I was not three and a half pounds overweight, and I certainly did not lose it in 20 minutes. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, um, that stuck in my head because, uh, you know, to... the last time that I had problems on the scale at 154 was with Vernon Forrest in the rematch. I lost way too much weight in that second fight. What um, weight was that, real quick? 154. Same thing as Shane. 154. So, I only fought 154 three times in my career. Twice against Forrest and once against Vernon. All my other fights have been 160 and higher. I'm not 154. And, and that's why I'm saying, that's, why, that's my next question, but go ahead and I'll ask you it. Yeah, so uh, I remember that rematch with Forrest. Uh, they, they gave me that fight six-week notice. I was 20, 28 pounds overweight. I lost all that weight in six, pound, uh, in, in six weeks. The day of the weigh-in, I lost eight and a half pounds. So I was just weight drained. Yeah. I remember it traumatized me being that weight drained. So fast forward to the Mosley fight. I wasn't weight drained, but that whole losing three and a half pounds the night before the fight. And it psychologically, you know, brought me back to that, that mental trauma of that forest fight. And I never, I fought not to lose instead of fighting to win in that Mosley fight. You know, so it just, it was mental. It wasn't really physical. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to look because I was watching the, the fight this morning. So I'm saying, okay, now it's starting to make sense, you know. 
Yeah, I really didn't put myself in position to, to take chances to win because I wasn't confident in, in my legs. I wasn't confident in my conditioning. I wasn't confident how that I was going to react. That like I said, in me, it looks like you were waiting yeah, just to I wasn't, catch him. I wasn't confident. I, was, just was I, wasn't, I wasn't punching freely off of instinct like you're supposed to. Everything's yeah. supposed to be reactive. What you trained in the gym, innate, you don't right. think about it. Everything was thinking in there, thinking, thinking, thinking. And then when I, I would go to the corner, I would just be thinking about, okay, I need enough energy to last the distance. I need to preserve my energy this round. I need it. You can't fight like that. You can't fight like no. that. So I, I trained not to lose. And it was a it was a boring, stinky fight. That I still thought I won, but either way, neither of us deserved to win, which yeah, yeah. which we didn't. Did you decide then you gotta go up and wait? That was my well, question. That wasn't my weight. That wasn't my weight. So you so you knew I have no business at, at one fifty four. I have thirty seven fights as as a professional, only three were at one fifty four. I didn't even fight one fifty four as an amateur. As an amateur, I fought at 156, and uh, I never even—I never made 154 in my whole professional amateur career, except for three fights, and that's two Vernon Forest fights and one Shane Mosley fight. It wasn't my weight class. All right, all right, all right. So, um, through all this career, and you're going, you're, you're you're getting these big fights. You were always, you always brought it, though. I got to give you that. You always brought it, even when you had your losses. You always brought it. Yeah. But when did you say to yourself? It's time, or did somebody tell you? Did, did your family tell you? Did you say, oh, no, hey? No, no, no. You know, uh, every, every fighter uh, stubbornly makes that decision by themselves. And no, normally it's after a, a hardcore, you know, ass whooping that makes you think twice about it. And wh which and, one was that? And for me, it wasn't really, I mean, I lost twice to Jacobs, but the first one, you know, I tweaked my ankle. And the second one was after that long layoff. I had no legs and he just kept dropping me, but it, it wasn't like hitting me, beating me up, dropping me. He was just out, out of like- Strength dropping you? Just like strength dropping me, size dropping me. Uh, my legs felt old, dropping me. So that's when I started getting a hint. It's time to maybe start thinking about plan B. It was a second Jacobs fight. Cause I got dropped, I think like five times, but they weren't with real solid punches. They were just, it was just with, with with his pressure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't really, and it was glancing punches, and my legs weren't reacting the way they should. So that's when I realized, yeah, whatever they say about fighters losing their legs is absolutely true. Even in my last fight with Angulo, I, 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 I didn't think I, I seen that one. That last fight, I, I it, my last professional fight was April of 2018. I remember in that fifth round, my legs were already gone, and I remember. I remember making a, a a pack with myself and with God in the corner of the fifth round. Te lo juro. Get, get, I said, get me out of this fight I'm and I'm done. Say, get me out of this or get me, or get me through it at least. Get me, get me out of this fight and I'm done. And I squeaked out a split decision with a win with Perro Angulo. And I didn't announce my retirement. And mind you, Angulo was at the top of his game. No, 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 no. He, he was he's at the top of his power. He, yes. Angulo was, you know, he was always in... He yeah. was always on Gulo. He always yeah. brought it with power. He brought it with power. But he was always easy to hit. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I said, get me out of this fight and I'll call it a career. And uh, luckily, all the stars aligned for me where a lot of things happened that April. It was April 2018. I had my fight with Angulo the first week of April. The second week of April, I, uh, I had my daughter, you know. And then the third week of April, I got this call for... Uh, a DAZN boxing gig to be a color commentator. So the month of April, was, was 2018. Was it just a guess or just a straight out job offer? No, it was a straight out job offer. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, so the month of April, 2018 was uh, life changing for me. Uh, God got me out of that Angulo fight with a win. Yeah. My daughter was born the following week. And then I get a call, you know, from a strange number uh, from, from London or England or somewhere. And I happen to answer it and it's, a, 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 a job offering for a the zone, you know, commentating gig. Even as an active fighter, they're willing to give you yeah. that that gig. Yeah, and if it wasn't for that call, I probably would have had another fight because uh, Al Heyman at PBC, you know, um, he already had fights lined up for me and bigger fights. You know, yeah. all I had to do was get past Angulo, and one of us was going to get a big fight. And luckily, I'm glad this gig came because it was probably going to be against the Charlo, and I would have taken it. And who knows how how that would have went. I don't even remember the Charles back then. 
I yeah, they were they were young up and comers. Yeah, you know they they uh, I, I I think they weren't champions yet in 2018. I, I or maybe they were, but they weren't they weren't killing like they were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then, so now you be, you take the gig as the zone, and, and again, guys, this is this is when when the fans say, well, they don't even know what it is about fighting. There's your record, man. So you when you have somebody commentator. On your fight, you want somebody that knows how it is to fight. Absolutely. You know what I mean, you don't want somebody like never been in the ring. I'm not going to mention names, but some of these guys just, ah, oh, just yeah. rub me the wrong way, bro. You know what I mean? But when you have somebody that's been in there and been fighting top level, who, who better than to commentate your fight? You know what I mean? But with that says, um, let, let's get to the questions of, of, of how you feel your, your opinion. Yeah. What do you think on, um, Father and son teams, as far as fighters. Uh, give me your opinion. I've had Ben Liras, I've had Robert Garcias, but give me your opinion. Uh, I'm not a fan of father-son relationships, and now that I'm a father, I would tell you that I, uh, one, I would never want my son to, you know, be a boxer. But if he did decide to do that, I wouldn't stop him. Yeah. And I would not want to be in his corner. I would give him my opinion, but I wouldn't train him. I wouldn't be in the gym daily with him. Yeah. I would just, I would be like a friend if my son really wanted to box yeah. because, I mean, in this ring, we've seen many relationships strain. In this gym, in my gym, in every gym across the country, boxer, uh, boxer uh, trainer, father, son relationships. Majority of the time, it doesn't work. Of course, there's, ex there's, yeah, there's, 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 there's an too. exception and exclusions to that, but they're the minority. They're normally you need someone that's an outside voice because you're training a kid into a teenager, into a young man, into a man, and you can't let a man really find himself in the ring if you got his dad yelling at him like he was when he was eight years old, like he was six years old. You can never let a man be a man or a woman be a woman. It just doesn't work. There's a lot of relationships that just fracture because of that, because you can't raise a champion like the same way you're going to raise a son. It, it's just totally different. And now that I'm a father, I can, I can validate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I can validate that. I can't talk to my son like a trainer. I got to talk to him like a, like a father. You know what I'm saying? Because a trainer can tell you things that a father can and vice versa. And in the corner, you, you can't distinguish it. But you can't you know, yeah. com compartmentalize the two. You're going to be the father all the time. Yes. You know, so I just not, think, not to mention, it's so brutal. What are you going to do as a father? when your son's on the losing side, maybe. Yeah, and, and most of the time, most of the time, they, they actually let it go longer yeah, than possible. Longer than possible. That, the only one that's- That's always ama amazing, bro. That, when a father lets his son take a whooping. I'm an like, exception to that is Kenny Porter, to Sean Porter in his last fight. Oh, okay, yeah. I thought he stopped that fight way too early in a fight that Porter was being competitive with, but then again, he was fighting pound for pound the best fighter in the world and bud yeah but that's an exception and that was his last fight after that retired right but yeah normally fathers let their sons you know uh take a beating in there and it's the referees that stop it it's like it, they're, they're just too close man it's just too close yeah. i don't it's like that crazy. dynamic yeah it's crazy you say it because ben lira this gym right here south the money he trains my son adrian corona he's got 13 fights and ben Number one rule, mind you, I've been with Ben since I was eight years old. One number one rule with Ben is when Adrian's training in the gym, you are not to be in the yeah, gym. Yeah, because the man knows. Because Ben knows. Yeah, Ben says when he's in trouble, he needs to look to me, not yeah. to his dad, not yeah. to his brother, not to his mom, to me. So it, it's like that. And, and this is why I brought Adrian when he wanted to turn pro. I go, if that's what you want, let me take you to Ben. You know what I mean? Because I know Ben's really... Really, uh, you're not going to fight until you're ready. You're not going to fight until you make weight. I'll give you a quick example of that. Uh, when I was an amateur still training here, uh, I remember John Molina. Remember John yes. Molina? Yes. His, his dad would train him. And then uh, he, John Molina's dad brought him to Ben here. And uh, I remember, you know, when they were sparring, I, he was too small for me to spar, but he, I would watch him spar while I was waiting for my turn. And the dad would always try to intervene, but... It wouldn't work when the dad had intervened. You know, John was only listening to Ben, and the dad never interrupted. That's why that, that dynamic worked, but that's why it worked when he was with here. And then John Molina decided to go elsewhere, and then it didn't work out for him. Yeah. But I remember him 
blossoming in this gym because of yes. that respect. And it just yes. did, you know, and it's because the father knew his space, uh, his, uh, his, his spot yes. in, that, in that corner. Few, few, few trainers allow that to happen, like Virgil Ortiz Jr. and Sr. In the corner, Sr. stays out of the way and he lets, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the trainer handle it. Right now he's going through trainers. I don't know yeah. who's in his corner right now, but Robert Garcia was the main voice. And then, um, and he doesn't intercept. He doesn't get in the way of that in the corner. I don't know how it is in the gym and that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah, and on that note, I see, and this is just me as a referee, sometimes I see three voices at one time in the corner. Yeah. You got to listen to one. Whoever your main trainer is, you know, not, not three different voices, you know what I mean? So, real, so with that said, um, let's get to the refereeing, you know, the refereeing part. Because let's be honest, guys, sometimes a commentator can, can really rip a, a referee apart. And you know what? We got it coming sometimes. But I want to ask you, Sergio, from all the fights I've done, from all the fights I've heard you done do, you've always been pretty much fair, always. And I respect that and I, I appreciate that. But what do, you see, what do you see in the officials today that you would like to change, encourage, discourage? Listen, man. Go easy, bro. Go easy, bro. I'm just letting I you know, Ray. I, I'm going right to keep it real. We're, from the, we're, right damn, we're damn near from the same area or neighborhood, all right? So I've, I got, some, I got some, some, some hardcore in me too, but I'm going to call the good, I'm going to call the bad. Yeah. And most of the time it's good because you're a great referee. You Thank stay you. out of the action. You That's stay out of the training. action, man. That, see, a lot of referees want to be part of the action. They want to they wanna make themselves seen. They want to make themselves heard. They, want, they, they just want a little bit too much limelight. That's not your job. The third man in the ring is supposed to be calladito. Not That's doing right. nothing. And the best fights are the ones where you guys are out of the equation. The best compliment I was telling you earlier to give a referee, in my opinion, is who did that fight? Who, who did that the fight? referee in that fight? Who did that fight? You know what I mean? I don't even, even when they're tied up, I don't even want to touch you. You know what? Work out of it. Work, Work out, out of it. it. Your hands are free. Work out of it. Because, again, and, and I'm saying this with, with true um, knowledge, California, we are the most trained officials in the world. I believe that. We have officials from all that. over the world coming to Jack Reese's class of Soul Arbiter. The one, he, he invited all commentators for free he, to he, go. He called me for that. Yes. Yeah. And for the simple fact, just learn the rules so you know what we're looking at. And, and, and you know what? They come from all, and not to try to brown nose, um, Andy Foster, the executive officer of California, Mark Raylia, the chief inspector, they hold us accountable, bro. They should. They hold us accountable. They should, and they show judges accountable too. Yes, and, and you know what? If we drop the ball, like Andy Foster said, well, I'm gonna let you sit down for a little while and think about that. You know what I mean? Straight out, bro. He will not, and he addresses all the issues. Um, other states tend to like, I'm going to keep my mouth shut and let everybody say with it. And I think it's better to address it, explain it, and then leave it where, it go, leave it where it's at. What do you feel about that? Well, I like the fact that they, they're, they're letting you know how they feel and they put you on the spot. I would like for them to do that more with a lot of officials, not only put them on the spot in private settings, but public settings yes. too. Put you in the public uh, court of, uh, of, of thought of the fans, of the people in the business, of the reporters, of the writers, of the trainers, and the boxers. So you gotta, you gotta go through the scrutiny that the fighters go That's through, right. that the judges go through, and I think referees should do that as well, because whenever there's a, a, a debatable or questionable uh, outcome or opinion, you need to be put on the spot just like a, like, like a trainer and yes. anyone else, because they just let it slide. And for big fights where one scar was one scorecard was outrageous, I'm I'm talking about judges now, not referees. Maybe even find them. If you hit them in where it hurts, and that's yeah, the yeah, pocket, yeah. hit them where it hurts. You're not getting that next gig. Put them on timeout. Put them on suspension. There you go timeout. That's what hey. that's what uh, that's what Andy Foster called. There you go timeout. A little timeout. Yeah. We'll get back to work. Because, but I'm gonna let you think about that. Because that hits them where it hurts and that's the wallet ultimately we all do this for a living so if you if you if you put them in that in that suspension and let them really think about 
and watch the video and watch the fight and see where they went wrong. And then maybe we could start, you know, changing things from the outside in. But since we don't do that and only certain states do that, we still have the same issues and the same problems in boxing. Well, like Jack Reese says, we owe it to those fighters from a four rounder to a title fight to give them our best, to be accountable for it because that guy in the cheap seat that used his hard earned money to right. come to watch that fight and you don't do the, the best that you can do or stop it too early or heaven forbid, stop it too late. You're cheating not, not only him, but you're cheating that guy that paid big money to sit on the, on the, on the ring side. Not only that, but the fighter as well, because one wrong decision can cost them another big fight or another big payday. Yeah, boxing, when you lose a fight in boxing, it can throw you back, not like MMA. Some MMA guys could lose, 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 but because they're such an action-type fighter, they could keep going, getting title fights. Not only that, but their pay is, you know, totally different than our pay. Yes. One setback on, on, in boxing would set you back zeros you know, commas and yeah, zeros. Yeah. One, you know, setback in UFC is it's maybe one zero. Yeah. They don't get paid the prize money boxers yeah. get paid. That's why you see Francis Ngannou and Conor McGregor making career high paydays come into boxing. boxing yes. And that's why you see more of these guys. But that's a separate yeah, it's subject a, there, Ray. I would have bet beat McGregor. Eh? Okay, <laughs> that's right. So, <laughs> uh, what do you, um, so from a commentator's point of view, hmm. And again, you've always been legit. I've never heard you badmouth none of us. You might say your, your thoughts, and I give you props on that. What do you think about instant replay on all fights, not just title fights, on all fights? What do you think about instant replay, whether it be a knockdown, a headbutt, a cut, you know? It sounds like a great idea, right? Uh, but it's just like open scoring in boxing. You know, when there's open scoring in boxing, about that? I hate open scoring because then a guy's – in a close fight, you know, yes. uh, a guy's going to want to protect the lead or he's not going to take chances. That's right. And that's if he's right. ahead by a lot of points, he's definitely not going to take chances. But when a fight is up, you know, 50-50 and the trainer says, you got to win this next round, yeah. sometimes you don't have to win the next round. You're comfort comfortably ahead, yeah. but the fighter does something great and goes out and knocks a guy out. So I hate open scoring, and I don't think, I don't think that's a good idea for boxing. It works for the NFL because – the timeout could be 5, 10, 15 minutes. They'll go look at the camera. And, you know, in boxing, if you have a fighter, you have one minute to, re to, to recoup. If they have to go uh, and, and see the instant replay of a slip or a knockdown or an illegal punch, it's going to take more than one minute, in my opinion. Uh, so I just, I don't like it. Hey, guys, thanks for watching on YouTube. If you want to see the rest, go on Patreon, guys. I appreciate it and check it out.